Hello and welcome to this lecture on strategies for selection decision making. An important part of the selection process is determining how to take the pieces of information gathered from a collection of selection tools and then combine the pieces to make an effective hiring decision. So let's get started. In the selection process, a variety of selection tools are used to gather information about job candidates. The hiring manager then uses this set of information on each job candidate to make the hiring decision. The information processing demands on the decision maker are fairly high because it is difficult to determine the best way to combine and interpret all of the information. In a simple selection decision scenario, information processing demands on the hiring manager are lower. In this condition, there is one position with several applicants being considered. The process will be less costly and complex if there is only one actual job opening and a few, maybe 10, people applying for the job. Of course, the process becomes more expensive and time consuming if an organization has numerous openings for a certain type of job. Imagine a new software call center being established. The hiring manager may need to hire 500 call center representatives and may receive applications from 5,000 interested people. Although there is only one type of position opening, the process will still be demanding. Under a scenario of complex selection decisions, obviously the information processing demands become even greater. In a complex selection decision setting, the hiring organization will have several applicants and several positions at the same time. The hiring manager must not only decide who to hire, but also match each new hire with the most appropriate job. This relates to the concept of fit in the selection process, which matches the KSAOs of job applicants with the tasks, duties, and responsibilities of a position. Let's move on. For obvious reasons, we want to minimize the errors that are made in the selection decision process. It is best to hire individuals who will be successful on the job and not hire individuals that will fail. Good hires result in higher economic gain to the organization, while bad hires can be disastrous. At the same time, failing to hire a job applicant who would actually be a good employee means that an organization loses out on a great employee and a competitor can then hire this applicant to its own advantage. Of course, the selection decision is not perfect. Anytime we use imperfect measures, there will be error present in the measurement data. The presence of error can lead to two types of selection decision errors. The first issue is that of false positive errors. In this case, erroneous acceptances of job applicants occur. In other words, a false positive means that an individual is hired, but should not have been hired. The applicant successfully passes through all of the stages in the selection process, but is then unsuccessful on the job. From your personal experience, think about a time when your organization hired an individual that turned out to be incompetent. What effects did that poor hiring decision have on the organization's profitability, not to mention co-worker morale. This is important stuff. Because of the possibility of false positives, many organizations will use probationary periods for new hires to make sure that things will work out and to avoid the problems related to terminating the employee. A second issue is that of false negative errors. In this case, erroneous rejections of job applicants occur. In other words, a false negative means that an individual should have been hired, but is not hired. The applicant fails to pass through the selection process, but in fact would have been successful on the job. These errors are obviously more difficult to detect, but it is important to minimize this type of error because the organization wants to hire the best possible employees instead of passing on them, while other organizations can benefit from them. In general, the goal of the selection process is to maximize the identification of true positives and true negatives, while minimizing false positives and false negatives. Let's move on. 
In the selection process, we collect job-related information on job applicants to predict who should be hired. Data is collected through the use of one or more selection tools, such as applications, tests, or interviews. Some selection tools are mechanical or objective in nature, such as a paper and pencil cognitive ability test, while other tools use expert judgments and scoring, such as an interviewer scoring a job candidate on answers to interview questions. Judgmental data is subjective data, whereas mechanical data is objective data. These methods of collecting data are in the far left column. Judgmental, mechanical, both, and either or both. Once the data is collected, the organization must then decide how to combine this information to make a good hiring decision. Data can be combined in either a mechanical or a judgmental manner as well. Combining data in a mechanical manner means that no human judgment is used in combining or interpreting the data. It may be collected judgmentally, but when combining the many scores on many predictors, it is mechanical. For example, a multiple regression equation can be developed from existing data that mechanically weights the various predictor scores into a best fit combination. In other words, combining data in a judgmental manner means that decision makers use their judgment, or in other words, their gut or their intuition in combining and interpreting applicant data when making the hiring decision. For example, a hiring manager can eyeball a set of applicant files and then use his or her judgment or expertise to choose the applicant that they feel is the best candidate. As you can see in this chart, there are eight different methods of collecting and combining job applicant data. Each method depends on the use of judgmental or mechanical data collection, as well as judgmental and or mechanical combination processes. As you can see in the column under the heading of mechanical methods, predictors can be combined in different ways, including the following. Trait ratings. Judgmental data are collected, but mechanically applied. Pure statistical. Data are collected mechanically and combined mechanically. Mechanical composite. Both judgmental and mechanical data are collected, but are then mechanically combined. Mechanical synthesis. Mechanical and judgmental data are subjectively combined and then mechanically evaluated. Look at the right-hand column in the table. Judgmental methods of combining predictors include the following. Pure judgment. Gut feelings and intuitive responses are combined subjectively by the decision maker. Profile interpretation. Objective data are collected, but judgmentally combined. Judgmental composite. Judgmental and mechanical data are collected, but are then combined judgmentally. Judgmental synthesis. Both mechanical and judgmental data are gathered and then mechanically combined and then judgmentally evaluated. You may be asking the question, which method is best? In general, the research shows that mechanical methods of combining predictor data is best. While everyone thinks that they have a great intuition or they are great judges of character, the reality is that they probably are not. Too many outside factors can influence the decision process on any given day. So it is better to minimize subjectivity in decision making. This may hurt our feelings a little bit, but it's actually the truth. Let's move on. You might recall that I stated in a previous lecture that correlation was the same thing as bivariate regression, which is also known as simple regression. However, bivariate regression takes correlation a little further. Bivariate regression does indeed require one variable to be positioned as a criterion and the other as a predictor. Correlation does not require that. You can claim one variable as the IV or the DV or vice versa for the other variable. It does not matter. So bivariate regression is a linear relationship between two variables. By linear, I mean that when you plot the observations on a graph, their relationship can be adequately explained by a straight line. With bivariate regression, we have y as the dependent variable, x as the independent variable. 
A is the place where the line intersects the y-axis, and B is the slope of the line. By positioning one variable as the IV and the other as the DV, we can accurately predict or forecast the DV with any value of the IV. Let's move on. Let's say we collect data on two variables for several people and plot each observation. Each dot is a person, and for each person, they have both an X score and a Y score, where the Xs are on the horizontal axis and the Ys are on the vertical axis. Now, if you and I were asked to draw a line that would best represent the scatter gram or scatter plot here, your line might be slightly different from mine. Let's move on. Rather than eyeballing it, the use of regression finds the line of best fit. Here the line is represented by y hat. It is the expected value of every dot's y value. Each dot has an observed y value too. If you look closely, you'll see that there is a difference between the expected value of y, that is y hat, or the line, and the actual or observed value of y, which are represented by the green dots on the scatter plot. The A value is the y-intercept, or place where the line intersects the y-axis. The B value is the slope of the line, which is the rise over the run, the change in y over the change in x. And the Greek symbol here, delta, indicates change. So here we can see that rise over run is the change in y and the, over the change in x, and it is the slope of the line. Let's move on. So you might be wondering, how does regression magically determine the correct slope of the line? Well, the line of best fit simply minimizes the distance from the actual observation or each actual y value for each dot to the predicted observation, which is the y hat or the line on the graph. Since some predicted distances are technically negative, take a look at y sub 1, 3. We square the distances to make them all positive. y sub 1, 3 has a higher observed value of y than an expected or predicted value of y noted by the line. We then seek, to, we then seek the line that minimizes the overall square distances from all of the observations. Thus, we have a least squares regression line. Let's move on. If I asked two people to pick a number between 1 and 100 and the closest choice would win a prize, what number would you pick and why? You should pick 50 to minimize your distance from every possibility in the set. Don't pick 1 and don't pick 99. You'd be making a horrible decision. You want to pick the number in the middle of the array. If the data are normally distributed, the number in the middle is the median and the mean. In this case, y bar, or the mean of y, is the best estimate that we have for predicting any randomly selected value of x. So regression helps us make a better guess at what y should be than just picking the average of y. If we use ordinary least squares, or OLS regression, we want to see how much better this line is than the flat line, which represents y bar, or the mean of y. So we can dissect our deviations in the regression line from our line of y bar. We then have a total deviation, the distance from the observation to y bar, and that total deviation is comprised of the deviation explained by our regression line, which is the distance from y hat to y bar, and the deviation not explained by our regression, which is the distance from the observation, or y sub i, to y hat. 
Now we can extrapolate to the least squares formula and partition our error. The deviation unexplained by regression is the error. It is the difference between our observed and actual values of y with the predicted value of y, between our observed or actual values, I should say. Let's move on. Remember what I said about the fact that deviations from the expected value can be partitioned into two parts. Well, those two parts are the deviation explained by the regression or the line of best fit and the deviation unexplained by the regression, which is the distance from the line of best fit to the actual observation or dot on the graph. Let's go back and look at the graph again. So we have total deviation is the distance from y sub i, which is the actual observed value of y, to y bar, which is the mean of y, which is the best guess of what y would be. The total deviation is divided into two forms of deviation, the deviation explained by the regression and the deviation unexplained by regression. The goal with regression is to minimize or shorten the distance between the observed y sub i to the expected line y hat. Let's move on. So let's take what we looked at graphically and what we discussed in plain English on the last slide and look at it mathematically. Now I apologize, but I could not get the superscript exponent feature to work in this formula. So I just indicated that each component in parentheses is multiplied by itself instead of the component in parentheses being squared with an exponent of 2. So keep that in mind. Also, remember that the reason we square these distances, which is what they technically are, distances, we square them because some are below the line and some are above the line. And if we simply added the distances above the, the line to the distances below the line, they would equal 0. So first, let's explain the variables y bar is the mean of the total group. y hat is the predicted value of y or the point on the line above each value of x. y sub i is the actual or observed value of y. So here we are again trying to partition the total deviation of any observation from the mean of y. c above y sub i minus y bar squared is the squared distance from the observation to the flat line on the graph. Then look to the right side of the equal sign. We have the squared distance from each point on the line to the flat line. That is y hat sub i or each point on the line of best fit. We also again have y bar. Then we add the square distances between each observation and its expectation or line of best fit. Let's move on. To sum up OLS regression with only two variables, we know that it is also simple regression and also bivariate regression, the same thing and it's equivalent to correlation. It attempts to reduce the amount of error in the prediction of y from x, and to do this, the regression generates a line of best fit that minimizes the squared distance between the actual observation and the expected value of y, which is the sloped line. Remember that we square the deviations from the observation to the expectation line because sum are negative and some are positive, and they would simply offset each other and zero out if they weren't squared. Thus, regression derives a line that best represents the relationship between x and y. Let's move on. Once we have collected information on job applicants using a number of selection tools, we then need to combine the data. The remainder of this lecture will focus on multiple regression. In this method, applicants are measured on a number of predictors. Those predictors, like these, 
can be judgmentally or mechanically scored. It does not matter. We have applications and interviews which are judgmentally scored, and we have intelligence and personality tests which are mechanically scored. The dependent variable can also be either judgmentally or mechanically scored, but it must be either an interval or a ratio type variable. Then the predictor scores are entered into a regression test that predicts our criterion of job performance. Each predictor has a regression weight that represents its relative influence on job performance. All job applicants are assessed on all predictors and then the data is entered into the equation to give individual combined scores. Multiple regression is a compensatory method in that high scores on some predictors can offset low scores on other predictors. Two applicants can have the exact same expected performance criterion scores and they can differ in terms of scoring higher or lower on individual selection tests. The result is a so-called line of best fit. That is, there is a line that statistically minimizes the distance from each observation to the line. Some observations, again, are below the line and some are above it. But overall, the distances are at a statistical minimum. Then we can use the resulting formula for the line of best fit to insert scores on predictor test and compute the expected level of performance for any applicant. Let's move on. This Venn diagram is of a multiple regression with two predictors. General mental ability is noted as X sub 1 and conscientiousness is noted as X sub 2. You'll notice that there is no overlap between X sub 1 and X sub 2, which indicates that they are not correlated, so they share no variance. So R squared sub 1, 2 is equal to 0. There is some overlap between each predictor and the dependent variable noted as Y, which represents the scores on job performance. This is what we want. We want each predictor test to overlap with or correlate with or share variance with the criterion. However, this exact scenario never happens with unrelated predictor variables. It simply represents an ideal state. So only when the correlation between the two predictor variables equals zero will the total variance explained be the exact sum of the variance explained in Y by X sub 1 and by X sub 2. In multiple regression, the total variance explained by more than one predictor is noted as the capitalized R squared. In fact, R alone, not squared, is called the multiple correlation, so R squared is the multiple regression variance explained. Let's move on. Here is a more realistic case. In this diagram, X sub 1 and X sub 2 are indeed correlated as visually displayed by their overlap. In fact, the variance that the two predictors share with each other is represented by the spaces called E and G. Each predictor overlaps with the criterion, which is what we strive for in selection testing. X sub 1 overlaps with Y in the area represented by D and G. X sub 2 overlaps with Y in the area represented by G and F. If we add up those areas, we get D plus G plus G again plus F. E is not in the area of overlap between any predictor and the criterion, so it's thrown out. Here it just represents the overlap between the two predictors with each other. So back to the variance explained in Y. We cannot count the area G twice. So the total area of overlap or variance shared is D plus G plus F. Let's parse this out a little bit. On the top row here on the left, we see the lowercase Greek letter sigma. Sigma is the standard deviation of a distribution of scores. Sigma squared, as in these equations, equals the variance of those scores. So the square of a standard deviation equals variance. So 100% of the variance of X sub 1 is represented in the Venn diagram as A plus D plus E plus G. 
the total variance or sigma squared of x sub 2 is b plus e plus f plus g. The total variance of y is c plus d plus f plus g. The shared variance between x sub 1 and x sub 2 is e plus g. The shared variance of x sub 1 and y is d plus g. The shared variance between x sub 2 and y is f plus g. The total variance explained is noted as capital R squared. This is the total variance explained in R by both x sub 1 and x sub 2, which in this diagram is d plus f plus g. It is not the simple sum of the overlap between x sub 1 with y and the overlap between x sub 2 with y because x sub 1 and x sub 2 both explain g. You cannot count g twice. Let's move on. When we run a regression model test, we get two forms of the same equation. The first is the unstandardized version. It has a non-zero y-intercept, which represents some non-zero value of y when all of the other variables, the predictors, are zero. It is, in essence, the minimal score on y anyone can possibly get on performance. The standardized version has a y-intercept, too. But it is actually zero, so it doesn't really have an intercept. I know that sounds sort of circular, but if you really, really want to, you can write y equals 0 plus the value of x1 times, but nobody does that. The 0 is omitted. The two versions of this formula are the same thing and will produce the same results. Let's move on. Let's take a closer look at the variables contained in these two versions of the same formula. The unstandardized regression coefficients are known as B weights, and standardized coefficients are known as beta weights. We'll get to that in a minute. It's easier to plug and chug test values into an unstandardized regression formula because scores can be entered in their original metric. For example, you can enter actual IQ points, actual interview scores ranging from 1 to 10, etc. With standardized regression coefficients, or beta weights, you have to standardize each predictor, such that one standard deviation change in X results in one standard deviation change in Y. Yuck. However, standard re standardized regression coefficients are on the same metric the standard deviation, and not something as different as IQ points and interview scores and Likert personality scores. So they can be compared. It's a crude comparison and not technically perfectly possible, but when one beta weight exceeds another beta weight in a regression formula, we can say that the first predictor weighs more or is more important than the other predictor. Because in most cases, predictor variables are correlated somewhat with each other, the beta weight should be less than the bivariate correlation. Only when predictors are completely uncorrelated with each other will the beta weights equal the correlations. That never, ever, ever happens. Let's move on. So if your software spits out a formula, you can just plug and chug the applicant scores into the formula. Here we see that we have four different selection tests. We have an IQ score, we have a personality trait score, we have an interview score, and a score for the application form. We have these four predictor scores for every applicant that made it through the selection process. This formula omits the values of the regression coefficients, though. We'll need to see an actual formula next. Let's move on. Are the regression weights here standardized or unstandardized? Well, the first clue is that three of them are larger than one. And standardized regression weights are limited to the range of negative one to positive one. 
The second clue is that there is a non-zero y-intercept. It's 50. Let's look at this formula a little closer. Four predictors are combined statistically to predict who our best performer will be. Now here I've taken the same formula from the previous slide and added some fictitious regression weights so that the formula is now 50 plus 0.5 times the score on the first predictor plus 8 times the score on the second predictor, etc., etc. Now we also have some fictitious applicant scores on these four tests. You can see here that applicant B scored better on the IQ test than applicant A but worse on the conscientiousness test and the interview, and better on the application form. So y hat is the predicted value of y, or the predicted value of job performance. We have a y hat sub a and a y hat sub b for the applicants a and b respectively. This is what we've been trying to predict all along with our mini selection test. Now we can plug and chug those values into the regression equation and see who comes out on top. In this case, applicant B just barely scores better than applicant A. So should we offer the job to applicant B? Well, are we using banding? Is the band a fixed or sliding band? Are the scores essentially the same because of the application of the standard error? Those are decisions that HR pros will have to make based upon valid selection tests and valid measures of job performance on which those tests were validated. There's plenty of room for human judgment still in the HR selection process, even though half of the tests scored here were mechanically derived and all of them were mechanically combined. This is where your value as an HR professional truly comes into play. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all, folks.